Hello and welcome to Terra Physica channel, and today we'll dive into cosmology, the branch of physics that's all about unraveling the birth, evolution, and potential end of the universe. As of now, cosmology has cooked up quite a portfolio of hypotheses on how the universe might meet its end, and we're about to discuss one of these scenarios today. Hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell to stay in the cosmic loop. Here we go. The current stage of the universe's evolution is often referred to as the stellar epoch, because the primary energy source driving the modern universe is the transformation of light elements like hydrogen and helium into heavier ones within the cores of stars. This process is known as nuclear fusion. The light elements are sourced from interstellar gas, and the fuel reserves are pretty extensive. The current volume of interstellar gas exceeds the total mass of stars in the universe by about a factor of 10. However, there will come a moment when these reserves are depleted, and the formation of new stars becomes impossible. Estimates suggest this will happen in about 1 to 100 trillion, or 10 to the power of 14, years from now. For comparison, the current age of the universe is estimated at 13.8 billion years, which is just a little over 1% of even 1 trillion years. So essentially, the stellar epoch in the universe's evolution is just beginning. Following the stellar epoch, we'll enter what's known as the degenerate era, or, as it's sometimes called, the decay era. New stars won't form during this time. The stars that have already formed will utilize the light elements within them over several tens of billions of years, and ultimately perish. They'll either become white dwarfs, small and hot droplets of very densely packed matter unable to sustain nuclear reactions, or neutron stars, or even black holes, the primary source of energy during this phase, will be the slow cooling of neutron stars and white dwarfs, which will emit energy accumulated over their lifetimes into space through thermal radiation. Occasionally, this process will be punctuated by short and bright supernova bursts. For example, some supernovae will flash as a result of white dwarf collisions, and the collision or merging of neutron stars or their absorption by black holes, might lead to the creation of kilonovae. Moreover, as neutron stars cool down over trillions of years, they might potentially explode in processes similar to supernova bursts. However, this is still a hypothesis, no neutron star has had the time to cool sufficiently for this to happen throughout the entire history of the universe. As for white dwarfs, their cooling process will take even longer, around 10 to the power of 15 years, or about 10 times longer than the time from the universe's formation to the end of the stellar epoch, and roughly 10,000 times longer than from the Big Bang to the present day. After this substantial stretch of time, the last white dwarfs will cool to the temperature of the surrounding universe, just a few degrees above absolute zero. Even these last faint embers of the aging universe will fade, transforming into what we call black dwarfs. The universe will become an endless sea of darkness, with the remnants of dead stars and their frozen planets aimlessly drifting through cosmic coldness. After white dwarfs transform into black dwarfs, the universe's essentially only source of energy will be a hypothetical process, which we are almost certain exists, but we've never actually seen in practice. The decay of a proton, a topic we cover in a separate video. Most likely, a proton will decay into a positron and a so-called neutral pion, which, in turn, will decay into two photons after about 10 to the power of minus 17 seconds. A similar fate awaits the positron, which annihilates with one of the electrons, also transforming into photons, in essence, simply into light. Thus, each proton decay leads to the disappearance of approximately 1.7 times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms of mass, and the release of about 1.5 times 10 to the power of minus 10 joules of energy. In atomic terms, this is quite a lot, about 100 times more than what is released in one act of nuclear fusion. However, such processes, if they happen at all, go on very, very slowly, the average proton lifetime is at least 10 to the power of 34 years. This means that inside the Sun, for example, an average of 10 to the power of 23 protons with a combined mass of less than 1 gram should decay in one year, and approximately 10 to the power of 13 joules of energy should be released. For comparison, thanks to nuclear fusion, the Sun generates about 10 to the power of 42 joules of energy annually. So, in our epoch, the decay of a proton and the accompanying phenomena, simply get lost against the background of other much more intense processes, and practically do not affect the life of the universe. But when all other sources of energy are depleted, the decay of protons will come to the forefront. The decay of all the protons that make up the matter in the modern universe will, according to calculations, take from 10 to the power of 36 to 10 to the power of 42 years. When this process is complete, the degenerate era will end, and the only massive bodies in the universe will be black holes, drifting in the boundless sea of electrons, 
neutrinos, and low-energy photons. The universe will enter the next period of its history known as the era of black holes. But that's if protons do decay. If not, then the degenerate era is destined to last much longer, thanks to a process known as cold nuclear fusion. As we've mentioned before, by the time the degenerate era begins, there will be practically no interstellar gas left in the universe containing light elements. However, some reserves of these elements will still be inside white dwarfs, these could be elements like helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, silicon, and others. Theoretically, atoms of these elements can undergo nuclear fusion reactions with each other, releasing energy. However, for this to happen, their nuclei need to come close together at very small distances, which will be hindered by the Coulomb repulsion between the nuclei. To overcome this, the nuclei need to have high kinetic energy, and the substance composed of such nuclei needs to have a high temperature. The temperature of white dwarfs will be significantly lower, and these reactions will not occur in them. Stars become white dwarfs exactly because they don't have sufficiently high temperatures to sustain nuclear fusion reactions in the substance they consist of. And conditions for nuclear fusion will not be suitable inside black dwarfs, which have cooled almost to absolute zero. Here, the particle speeds will be far too low to overcome the Coulomb barrier. Nevertheless, from time to time, acts of nuclear fusion in black dwarfs will still occur, thanks to a phenomenon known as the tunnel effect, whereby atomic nuclei can teleport through the Coulomb barrier. So, even despite the very low temperatures of black dwarfs, nuclear fusion will still take place inside them, albeit very, very slowly. The result of this process will be the transformation of all atoms in all black dwarfs into iron atoms, the final point of any nuclear fusion chain. If the fusion of lighter atoms releases energy, starting from iron, you would need to expend energy to fuse atoms. Accordingly, such fusion will no longer be energetically favorable and will not occur spontaneously, even through the tunnel effect. A black dwarf, all the atoms of which have followed the nuclear fusion chain up to iron, is called an iron star. The conversion of all white dwarfs into iron stars will complete the process of stellar evolution, assuming protons do not decay. However, this will take much more time, no less than 10 to the power of 1,500 years, and it's quite likely that it will take significantly longer. What will happen next with the black dwarfs that have transformed into iron stars? For a very long time, nothing interesting. After which, presumably, iron stars will explode in supernovae, turning into black holes. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a clear description of the physics of the death process of an iron star, although this outcome is described in all the works I could find on this topic, not that many, as most contemporary scientists still believe that a proton decays. Be that as it may, the ending will be the same. The end of the degenerate era and the beginning of the era of black holes. With the only difference that in this case, the degenerate era will last much longer. According to calculations, if proton decay does not occur, the era of black holes will begin after an unimaginable period of about 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 25 years, and possibly much later. In the era of black holes, the primary source of energy in the universe will likely be the so-called Hawking radiation emitted by black holes. More precisely, it's more accurate to say that it's probable. Hawking's hypothesis about the existence of such radiation logically follows from our current understanding of physics, and related phenomena, like the Casimir effect, the Unruh effect, and the sokolov turnoff effect, are even experimentally confirmed. However, we haven't actually seen Hawking radiation itself, and may not be able to for a while. The thing is, this radiation is very weak. A black hole of stellar mass, for instance, emits about as much energy as a couple of kilometer wide asteroid does through thermal radiation. Capturing such weak radiation from a distance of several thousand light years, which is roughly the distance from us to the nearest black hole, is currently an insurmountable task for us and is likely to remain so in the foreseeable future. So, Hawking radiation is minuscule even compared to the radiation resulting from proton decay, and will only become a noticeable factor when all other radiation sources fade away. During Hawking radiation, black holes gradually decrease their mass, essentially evaporating. Today, we can neglect the rate of this process, the very slow decrease in the mass of black holes due to Hawking radiation in the modern universe, is more than compensated by their absorption of matter from the surrounding environment. However, in the late universe, this surrounding environment will be practically non-existent, so the loss of mass by black holes will become the dominant process. However, it will proceed very slowly, according to calculations, it will take about 10 to the power of 66 years for a complete decay of black holes with stellar masses, and the decay of supermassive black holes, like the one at the center of our galaxy, will take even longer, around 10 to the power of 106 years. After this impressive stretch of time, even black holes will vanish, 
the universe will become an infinite abyss, filled only with extremely sparse gas made of neutrinos and low-energy photons, and possibly a small number of electrons. There will be no sources of energy whatsoever in such a universe, the epoch known as the epoch of eternal darkness will begin. And since in this epoch, nothing worthy of mention will happen in the universe, its beginning can rightfully be considered the end of the universe's history, meaning, the end of the world. However, it's possible that things might unfold a bit differently. Some scientists suggest that black holes in the late universe will merge, potentially leading to the formation of several super hypermassive black holes, with a combined mass comparable to the mass of the universe. When these black holes merge, the result might be unstable. The newly born absolute black hole will explode, essentially giving birth to a new universe. In other words, as an alternative to the open model, where everything begins with the Big Bang and ends with the epoch of eternal darkness, an alternative cyclic model is proposed, in which the Big Bangs and the subsequent expansion and cooling of the universe are replaced by the concentration of matter in black holes, their merging, and the transition to a new Big Bang. In this family of cyclic universe models, it's worth mentioning the relatively recent cyclic universe theory formulated by astrophysicist Nikolai Gorkavy. Gorkavy noticed the experimentally established fact that the merger of black holes generates gravitational wave radiation, and a significant portion of the mass of merging black holes should be transformed into the energy of these waves. In simpler terms, the mass of the collapsing system of black stars decreases. In one of his works, Gorkavy concluded that in a system of gravitating bodies with decreasing mass, apart from the force of attraction, there should be a repulsive force, which under certain conditions may even surpass the force of attraction, and gravity will be replaced by anti-gravity, causing the scattering of matter from merging black holes into space. According to Gorkavy, this mechanism may give rise to the Big Bang and may end the history of our universe, giving rise to the next. I can't say that Gorkavy's hypothesis is universally accepted, but it at least deserves mention, as does the concept of the cyclicity of the universe in general. The key question here is whether black holes will merge with each other or whether they will completely evaporate. Unfortunately, to answer this question, we need to know things like the average density of matter in the universe, as well as the rate of its expansion, or more precisely, what this rate will be by the beginning of the epoch of black holes. Well, science currently can't definitively answer these questions, leaving room for reasoning and discussions. One thing is clear, at present, the universe has apparently lived only an infinitesimally small part of the time allotted to it. So no matter how its history ends, it won't happen anytime soon.